Last week, actually probably the week before, two weeks ago, as I was dealing with what I'm teaching and talking about in Christ and then how Christ is formed in us, I began to just realize, Lord, everybody out here, everybody in the world has all these views and ideas and concepts, and we live in a society that um, promotes that kind of thing. Do what you want to do. Be what you want to be. All those kinds of things. And I'm not. I, I, I'm not critical. And I don't want to be critical. I have no desire to be critical of uh, other churches or other people's philosophies or, or where they are. But I felt prompted to the Lord to go back to something that I've I've taught really for been teaching for. I would say 40 years around it, but in the last 30 years, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, for sure, I taught some things that um, changed my life and my perspective on the Word of God. And in the last two weeks, I have just felt prompted to do this, and 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 I, I say that because I, I'm not sure I can articulate everything from all of the different perspectives, as you'll see what I'm talking about in a moment when I get into this, of where we are. But I don't know anything else to say other than just to kind of toss it out there. And uh, I'll read you one verse of Scripture to begin, and we're going to look at this verse, but it's from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, and verse 4. And it says, Just as... He chose us in Him. What's that next phrase? When did He choose us in Him? Now, wait a minute. I wasn't born before the foundation of the world, I wasn't around. How did he choose me when I wasn't here yet? You forget who you're dealing with. You're dealing with the God who created you, who made you, who formed you, who did it all, made the earth, the world, and everything therein. But I want you to understand what Scripture teaches us. And the Apostle Paul clearly says, just as he chose us, in him before the foundation of the world, and here's what he chose, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, I'm going to come back to this verse in a moment, but the title of my message today is The Starting Point. The starting point. Too often, our history and our theology and our understanding of God starts off with the fall. What do you mean? Well, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Man has to recognize that he needs that he was a sinner. If he doesn't know he's a sinner, he doesn't know he needs a Savior. So you got to make sure they get the point that they were sinners and that everybody's a sinner and they need a Savior. And all of that's true. But when Adam fell into sin, that's not where purpose started. Now, if the starting point 
is from the fall or at the fall, and Jesus came and fixed it and restored us and brought us out of sin and paid the debt for sin, then we get back up here by way of the cross through the saving grace of God, we come back to who God purposed and designed us to be. Are you with me? But when you start with the fall and all have sinned, what happens to sinners? Tell me, what happens to sinners? They what? Huh? Where are sinners going to end up? Hell. Where are Christians going? If I could say it to you like this, when you start with man in sin and your eternal purpose is to just get them saved or born again and in a right relationship with God and ready to go to heaven, and then you start spending all of your Christian experience living in such a way that you've got to be able to get to heaven and it's all about if you don't live right, you can't go to heaven. If you have any problems or struggles or you go through anything, you may not make it. And we have a whole mindset of people out here. It's all about heaven and hell. Why? Because it starts with the fall. All of sin. Everybody's a sinner. The whole world needs to be saved. We've got to get the world saved. So when that's the starting point, God's purpose is then seen in light of man's need for redemption. And how many of you understand mankind needs redeemed? Do you understand? I'm not preaching against that. I'm not saying that. We cannot minimize redemption. I don't want to take anything away from it. I'm not trying to minimize it. But let me ask you a question. Is the only reason that Jesus decided to come to earth was because Adam blew it and sinned and God had to search heaven as the old song goes, looking for someone to go and Jesus finally said, because man slipped up, I'll go and I'll pay the price. Is that the only reason Jesus came to earth was to just save man? I don't think so. Why? If he knew me, before he ever made the earth and before he ever made the world, maybe even if Adam hadn't sinned, it was still God's purpose to have a family and a body of believers who would be in Christ and that Christ was going to come and walk with us and God's Spirit was going to come, maybe He came for a bigger purpose than just to save us. Maybe. Okay? Now, again, I, 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 I want to say this right, but if the only reason Jesus came to be the Savior, when He came and He paid for the sins of the world, and He died as you, he who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Maybe there's a purpose beyond just saving the world and just saving you that Jesus came to the earth. He is the Savior. Do you all understand that? I'm not minimizing that at all.
But in light of this, and what I'm trying to say, if the only reason Jesus came was to save men from sin, what are we going to do with the commission that God gave to mankind in Genesis chapter 1? I know all of you have read this, but look at it. Verse 28, it says, After he made Adam, then God blessed them, and God said to them, here's what he said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, if we go back to C, A is the heart of God, B is the creation, C is man, D is man fallen in this chart. If we go back to where when God made man and he placed him here on the earth and he gave his commission, this is what I want you to do, if that's the beginning, then everything in Scripture would be interpreted either governmental or, or and, and don't judge me too quick, I think I know a little bit about what I'm saying, or kingdom. Then it's all about a kingdom, and it's just about a kingdom, about the government of God. Then there's also those who start not with just the fall or with man or with creation, but want to start with God. Now, and, and, and I, I hear this, and we recognize we should start with God instead of with man, but involved in understanding, starting with God in the eternal God, We've got to determine what was God's purpose in creating man. What was in his heart? Well, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a man. He's going to sin. I'm going to send Jesus to fix his sin so I can take him to heaven. That's what a lot of people think and teach. He placed man on the earth, told him to have dominion. What about his sovereignty? What about the fact that God's a sovereign God? Wonder what the Apostle Paul meant Wonder what the Apostle Paul was saying, telling us. What was going on in the Apostle Paul's mind when he started in Ephesians 1 back in the heart of God making a statement, and we'll go back to Ephesians 1, 4. I want to read that verse to you, to you again. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He chose us before we ever existed. Here in his heart, before he ever, in the beginning, God. Genesis 1.1. He created the heavens and the earth, and the heavens and the earth were one. God, why was he creating this man? Why was he making man? Why was he placing him on an earth and telling him he had dominion? So we can go back to God, we can go back to creation, we can go back to man that he made, and we can go back to the fall. And if the starting point is 
in any one of those Does creation know the goal? Does man know the goal? Does sinful man know the goal? But what was the goal that was in the heart of God when he made us and placed us here? Say, Pastor, why is that the question? Why, why, why does it matter? Well, let me ask you a question. If you're somewhere and you don't know where you are and you ask for directions and I give you directions from where I am to where you need to go, where are you going to end up? You're going to be just as lost when you end up as you was when you started. What was God's goal when he made earth, when he made creation, when he made man, when everything that he made, what would a father, listen to me, a father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are eternal. God the Father, what would a father desire and purpose and ultimately intend for his people. So what I'm saying is we've got to have an ultimate starting point. Now, I, I want to make a couple of statements, and I'm, I'm sure not wanting to be critical, but the overriding theme the overriding theme of Christianity and Christendom in general is man's a sinner and he needs Christ so he can go to heaven. It's the overriding thing. And if you interpret the whole plan of God by one little section here, of redemption only, are we really getting the picture of what God's after? If we start with the fall and man in need of redemption, then here's what happened. Everything becomes about man. What does man need? What is man going to do? What's the provision that God has for them? In other words, God made man. Now God exists for man's benefit, for man's blessing, for man's future, and man becomes the central theme of everything God intended. So I'm asking you, is that God's Intention or, everybody say or, is there a hidden intention in the heart of God of what his purpose was that we can discover of why he made man and why he placed him here and the reason and the purpose that he placed him here? Let me read, and I know we may not be able to do this on, on the screen, but I want to read Ephesians 1, 4. I'm going to read it to you from the New King James Version, the Passing Version, the Message Bible, and the Amplified. I want you to just hear this Ephesians 1. It says, Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. The Passion says, and in love he chose us before he laid the foundation of the universe. The message says, long before he laid down the earth's foundation, he had us in mind and had settled on us as the focus of his love. The Amplified says, just as in his love he chose us in Christ, actually selected us for himself as his own, 
before the foundation of the world. So, God had a purpose when he made man. What was the purpose of Christ? Did God have a purpose for Christ before the foundation of the world? Here's what I'm asking you. Is the only reason Jesus came was for a redemptive purpose? The answer is no. It's what we've been hearing. That's been the overlaying thought of a lot of people. Let me ask you this. Is Jesus Christ related to eternity past? Listen, everything that was made was made by Him. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us as we beheld the only begotten, the, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, Jesus was in the bosom, in the heart, and with God from the very beginning, the Holy Spirit, the triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have always been there. That's who God is. Now, here's what I want to ask, and I don't, I don't want to goof you up. Because you say, well, it, God knew the man was going to sin. I, I know all that, and I go through it. But if man had, had never sinned, was it still in the heart of God for His Son to come to the earth and be the pattern Son to express who God was so that He had man and then He had God who came and took on a body and lived on earth for a purpose greater than just forgiving sin. Everybody with me? I'll illustrate this in a minute, but look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1, verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather to one, together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and earth in him. Now, follow me a moment. If Christ is just in heaven and God makes a man on the earth, but his eternal purpose is to gather into one all things in Christ, is it wrong for me to surmise that Jesus was going to be born whether man sinned or not because there's a purpose more than just salvation for Jesus coming to the earth. If man had never sinned, would Christ have been incarnated into the human family just like we have in Scripture? I believe yes, and that's what I'm trying to say. It seems evident to me from the Apostle Paul's writings in Ephesians, and we'll look at some of this, as he moves on an eternal level that the Father intended for his Son to be a means of accomplishing the purpose that he wanted to accomplish, that whether man sinned or not, if everything's going to be consummated in Christ, God's purpose was for Christ to come and to live on this earth and us to all come together so that all of us would be in Christ. Are you hearing me? I want you to see this. I, I, Pastor, why is this important? Well, in Ephesians 1, this 3, 4, 5, 6, 10, I want to just pull out some statements. But notice here in Ephesians 1, it said, He blessed us in Christ. Verse 4 says that He chose us in Him before the foundation. Verse 5 said 
having predestined, predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to his good pleasure. He predestined, is what he said. Back in the foundation before he made everything, it was his design for us to be in Christ. Okay? Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us, he made us accepted in the beloved. And verse 10, that in the dispensation and full, fullness of time, he might gather into one all things in Christ. I just really want to get this message across today. Can you see why I'm saying we can't read the Scriptures and interpret the Scriptures just in light of the fall and just make everything about man in sin, man getting saved, man going to hell, and man going to heaven. It's so much more than that. I personally believe that sin, the fall, time had nothing to do with the purpose of God having a many-membered body of sons just like Jesus on planet Earth. Now, I believe that the Father from the found, before the foundation of the earth intended for his son to have a body of life himself in the world before all of the creation was done and the ages to come, I believe that his whole purpose was that God wanted to have a son and his son have a body, a multi-membered body of believers who were just like Jesus. Pastor White, but we've been predestined before time began to be conformed to the image of Christ. And this whole series that I've been doing about we are in Christ, when you accept Christ, you're in Christ. Now we're in a process of growing and maturing until Christ is formed in us. God wants to have a family on planet Earth, a family who will share His life, share his nature, share his vision, share his purpose. And all of this family is going to be accomplished through his eternal son. I want to read to you a, a paper from Watchman Nee. Listen to what Watchman Nee says. We only see history back to the fall. God sees it from the beginning. There was something in God's mind before the fall and in the ages to come that thing, is to be, that thing is to be fully realized. God knew all about sin and redemption, yet in his great purposes for the church, he set forth in Genesis 2, there is no view of sin. Now, I, I, I don't have time to get into this, but if you read Genesis 2, you'll, 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 you'll begin to see that this is what he intended for his people and for the church to be. But it is through, though it is though he leaps in thought right over the whole story of redemption and sees the church in future eternity, having a ministry and a future history which is altogether apart from sin and holy for God. It is the body of Christ in glory expressing nothing of fallen man but only that which is the image of of the glorified Son of God. This is the church that has satisfied God's heart and has attained dominion. Here's what I'm saying. Redemption is not the end. It's not just about heaven or hell. If it's just about redemption, what do we do now that we're saved? 
Well, we just try to live good enough so that if we die or snatched out of here at the last moment, we don't go to hell. And that's what, that's what a lot of Christians spend their whole life trying to do. Now, I may make you mad, but I'm going to say it. Redemption is only a recovery program. Let me illustrate what I'm saying. Father gets up. He decides, you know what? I'm going to take my son out today. I'm going to take him to McDonald's. I'm going to take him to the playground. I'm going to spend a day with my son and have a real good time. So he gets the son all dressed up, gets him ready, and he's ready to go out. Didn't tell you he's four years old. And he says, son, go out and wait on the porch, and daddy will be right there. We're going to have a journey today and a lot of fun. So the boy doesn't stay on the porch. He's dressed up and ready to go, but he gets down, and it's been raining, and he falls in a mud puddle. And he's having so much fun in the mud puddle that he has mud from the top of his head to the sole of his feet. And the dad comes out, and he's ready to go. So he has to pick the boy up, take him in, bathe him off, change his clothes, and fix him because he has a plan for him. The purpose of the day wasn't getting the little boy clean. The purpose was Fellowship with his father. Are you hearing me? When you make the whole story of the day, just getting the boy who fell in the mud up from his fall and getting him cleaned up and then praying that he will stay cleaned up. Let me help you with something. He's going to get in the next mud puddle. Huh? Why? The mud puddle is not the purpose of the Father. We've got to understand that in the heart of God, He wants to have a relationship with a many-membered body. I've said it. I've preached it. I've said it over again. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the... See, but those who started to fall read that to say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody goes to heaven but by me. Are you with me? What do you mean? Well, they say that's what that means. It's not what it means. Jesus is the way to the Father. Why? He is the express image of the Father. He always did those things that please the Father. He is about getting you and I into a personal relationship with the Father. The Holy Spirit came to indwell you, to live inside of you, so that you could begin to express and feel and know and understand and comprehend the heart of the Father. Help me with this. Now, my reason...
is just what I'm teaching here for insisting that if we don't go back to the heart of the Father to know why God made man, what his purpose in making man, what the purpose and function of Jesus was in coming to the earth, if we don't get the heart of God in understanding this and knowing what his goal is, what his goal is over here, then all we're going to try to do is just keep people clean and washed and keep them out of mud puddles. Now, I think it's imperative that we begin to see Christ from a different point of view as more than just a Savior. How many of y'all understand he is the Father? Wanted the Son out of the mud. Wanted the Son cleaned up. It was for a purpose. Paul has answered here in Ephesians in one sentence most of the questions that we might ask about the father and his vast family that he has marked out for himself which is now being realized through his only begotten son. If you look at these, and I'm, I'm going to just go through this because I want to get to a particular place today if I have time. Who? He. God the Father. What? Chose us. Picked us out of, for sons in his family. How? In him, in Christ. Christ, the eternal son, involved in all aspects of our lives. When did he do this? Before the foundations of the world. That's in verse 4. Why? For himself. Why? For his own pleasure, glory, and satisfaction. The Father wants to have a relationship with you and I. Where? That we should be before him. What do you mean? In his immediate presence. Listen to me, guys. We've got to see God as a father. Now, the heart of God and everything back here in the beginning, with God there, we go with the fall of man, and here's what I'm saying to you. Had man never sinned, Jesus was still coming to earth. Why? Because he has a goal of having a body, a bride, a church that is absolutely victorious having dominion over all the earth. So, Pastor, what's the problem? Well, when your A is here and your Z is here, you don't know where you are. you got to go back to the right starting point and find out what was in the heart of God. See, we put a lot of people here at D in sin, you know, and here's what our theology does. You're in sin? Oh, go to hell, go straight to hell, do not pass gold, do not collect $200. If you don't believe it like I believe it, you're probably going to hell anyway. What do you mean you think God's grace is sufficient? God, God can't save you if you don't believe it just like me. Can he? Y'all know I'm trying to be facetious, right? Y'all don't really think I believe that. Sin 
has been dealt with. You don't have to wallow in the mud. You don't have to live in the mud. You don't have to live in sin. Now, there, there's so much I could say here, and, and I, I'm, I'm really setting this up because I really want to teach and get into training for reigning where that Christ is the pattern son and he is the image that we're after and that we are in Christ and Christ is being formed in us. And, and the only way that we're going to get to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ if we learn how to train to reign with Christ. Because if you really read this book and understand this book from the beginning in God to the goal that God has, you're going to see that His goal is that we have dominion and that we rule and reign with Christ. Now, again, there's a lot I could say here. I could talk about all kinds of fellowship that you have in Scripture. We can talk about fellowship in the gospel, which is studying the gospel. We can talk about fellowship of the Spirit. We can talk about fellowship with His Son. We can talk about the fellowship of His sufferings. But Paul, here in Ephesians, unveils his own deepest concern and is calling, Paul in Ephesians is calling us to become partakers of, in the fellowship of the mystery. Everybody say the mystery. If you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 9, it says, now we're, we're, everything I'm teaching today really is right out of Ephesians 1. And to make all see, let me ask you all, how many is all? What is the fellowship of the mystery? Now, we can talk about the fellowship of the Word, the fellowship of the Son, fellowship with the Spirit, but, but what is the fellowship of the mystery? Now, watch this. Which from the beginning of the ages has been... hidden in God. who created all things through Jesus Christ. Now, everybody say, the fellowship of the mystery. There is a participation in the Father that we need to experience where he begins to share with us the fellowship of the mystery which is in his heart. What is Father's heart? I want to take you somewhere. I want to make you something. I want to do something with you. I want you to accomplish something. I want you to walk with me. I want you to talk with me. I want you to be like me. I want you to... What's in his heart for his people? Let's read 9 again and then I'm going to go to verse 10. Watch this. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, verse 10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Now, watch this. Go to chapter 3, verse 10. I just read chapter 3, verse 10, didn't I? Now what? Let me get this straight. Now, 
why are we seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? So that we can be in the heart of God and see out from God's perspective what needs to be done. We have the responsibility to make known to principalities and powers the manifold wisdom of God. Are you with me? Everybody with me so far? Now hear me say this, to be with Christ in God meant to look out through God's eyes to see and relay and interpret all things in Him. Now, let me take you to a familiar passage of Scripture that we've all quoted numerous times, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? Look at me, listen to me. We're better than Adam ever thought about being because Adam was not in Christ. Adam was a human being on the earth and Christ was going to come and take up residence on the inside of men whether Adam sinned or didn't sin. Why? We are a new creation in Christ Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's probably what are you trying to say? Well, once you accept Christ, you shouldn't be like you were before you were saved. You should have a brand new viewpoint. What do you mean? You are now a new creation. You are made in the image of God. You are in the likeness of God. Christ has come into you. You now are in a right relationship with God. Your viewpoint should have changed. Go back to um, Ephesians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5.17. 5.17. I better turn over there myself. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone, we're in 16. Therefore, from now on, We regard no one according to the flesh. What are you saying? If you're a new creature in Christ Jesus, I need to quit looking at you in the flesh. I should have a new viewpoint. I should not be seeing you as a sinner. If anyone is in Christ, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. We got to have a new viewpoint. We got to start seeing somebody, each other by the Spirit. We need a new relatedness. Look at verse 18. He just says, If anyone's in Christ, he's new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have come new. Verse 18 says, Now what? Now what? All things are of God. Why don't we believe what the Scripture says? Why do we not believe that we're new creatures in Christ Jesus and now in our life all things are of God because we are... Let me ask you a question. When a baby is born and it begins to grow and mature... Does it have to learn how to do things? Is he less yours because he don't instantly act like a 21-year-old? Huh? Do you throw him away because he plays in the mud? Do you get rid of him because he doesn't know what to do? All things are of God, watch, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. 
We got a new viewpoint. We should have a new relatedness where we begin to see all things are of God and we begin to function with God and fellowship with God and work with God and flow with God. We got a new occupation. Look at verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Listen to me. Right this moment, you have divine favor with his son. Right this moment, you are an ambassador for God in this earth. God needs and wants and desires a body of believers who will express everything he is to a hurting world. I feel so inadequate to try to express what's in my heart and what I'm trying to say. We have a new yardstick, new measuring thing. All things are of God. How do we measure it? We're not to judge anyone according to the flesh. Paul taught three things of Christ, and I'm going to close. Paul speaks of his knowledge in the mystery of God. The first thing he says is in Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians 3, verse 4, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Here's, here's what he's saying. I want you to understand the mystery of Christ. What was that mystery? We've got to understand what that mystery is. What is the mystery? That the Son might have a corporate body through which he can express himself. What he's saying, it's the mystery of Christ, which is Christ in you, until Christ is formed in you, the means by which glory, God's glory is manifested on the earth. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. To them... God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I poured my heart out last week trying to talk about the glory of God and what I realized is most of us don't have a clue what God's glory is. Can I tell you what God's glory is really simply? It's God in you being manifested through you. That's the glory of God. God wants a body. His son Jesus is the head of this body. Colossians 1 verse 18 says, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. The firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. So the father, back in his original intent, in his heart, has intended to make the Son to be the center and the gathering point of all things in heaven and in earth. He desires to gather all things in Him. And let me close with verse 16 of Ephesians 1. It says, For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him and for Him. God's heart 
is about you through Christ having a relationship with him, the Father. I wish we could get away from fussing about mud balls. The church is full of mudslingers. I've got mud on me. Hi. You're bad too. Get over it. Get past it. Grow up. We have an eternal purpose to be like Christ and Christ be formed in us. I wish I knew how to wave a magic wand or do something where all of you all would just instantly go, whoopee. I'm there. But I'm learning. Your little grandson named Riker. That learning how to even enunciate words brings glory to Papa. What do you mean? Listen to me. helping one another and encourage one another, get through difficult times. And if somebody falls down, walk over, pick them up, knock the dirt off, encourage them, see if they need any medication, and get them on going. 